Hello students, welcome to this tutorial on Blender 2.80. We're going to start off by just talking a little bit about the interface. Uh, this hasn't changed an awful lot in terms of broad principles from Blender 2.79, but uh, some of you may not be familiar with that, so we'll give a little kind of a quick overview here of how this whole thing works. So, the biggest part of my window here, what you're looking at, is called the 3D view. And that's pretty self-explanatory. It just sort of, it, it's a view into 3D space. In our simulated scene, basically that's our entire universe, our entire world for the scene that we're modeling. Um, over here on the left, we have our tool palette, which can be um, viewed or dismissed with the T key on the keyboard like this. You know, if you need a little more room and you don't need to click on anything over here, you can get it out of your way. Uh, on the right hand side you can also bring in a properties panel with the N key on the keyboard. That's this guy right here. And again you can just get it out of your way if you don't need it. Uh, but the properties will show you the location of whatever object you have selected. Uh, it'll show you whether or not it's been rotated since it was created. Uh, its scale compared to its original dimensions and it'll also give you actual measurements in terms of how uh, how many blender units, which we'll talk about what that is in a minute. Uh, it gives you the dimensions. You can also click on this little tool tab right here and it will give you um, options for whatever tool you have active. So right now we just have a selection tool active, so we don't have a lot of options over here, but that's what that's for. So I'm going to dismiss that for now, get it out of the way. If you watch right down here in this area, these three uh, black squares represent my left mouse button, my middle mouse button, also the wheel, and my right mouse button and then whatever keys I hit on the keyboard will show up in this area so if I show and dismiss that properties panel you can see there's the letter N because that's the key I'm hitting on the keyboard. Over here on the right um, we have this is called our outliner in the top right this area. We'll talk a little bit more about uh, what the outliner does because it's very important so the outliner is a hierarchical list of everything in your scene. Right now we have three objects in our scene. We have a camera, which I know this doesn't look much like a camera, but that's what it is, that's what it represents. We have this cube, obviously, that you can see here. And we have a lamp, or in other words, a light, a light source. Those are the only three things in our scene, and they are all contained in one collection. That's a new concept in Blender 2.80, collections. We use those instead of layers. We used to just have layers and be limited to 20 layers, and now we can have collections. An object can be in more than one collection, or it can just be in a single collection. One uh, cool thing about collections is you can turn an entire collection on and off with this little eyeball over here. You can show and hide an entire collection. You can also select things through the outliner. So if I know that I want to collect, select an object with a certain name, I can click on the cube. And you can see that it has an orange outline now showing that it is selected. I can also rename the cube. So if I double click here, it highlights the text of the name and I can call this default cube. And that's now the object's name. Um, so I can keep my scene organized. Some, some scenes will have thousands, even on occasion hundreds of thousands of objects, and putting them into collections that make sense and also giving them names can make your scene manageable in, uh, in ways that it would quickly become really unmanageable. Um, so that's a good thing to understand is, is how to use the outliner there. Now down here, all these tools that we've got here, um, we have a lot of different kind of areas where we can interact with our scene. This little render tab here um, allows us to 
select the render settings and and for those of you wondering what a render is a render is what uh, we've got you know kind of a 3d scene here with you know a reasonable approximation of uh, there's a shaded side to this cube and a lighter side and a slightly uh, darker side but this does not look very realistic if I want to see what this thing looks like if I want it to look photo real I need to choose different render settings and actually render this out to let the computer calculate what it should look like so over here this is where I set up those settings I've got my output settings this is where I tell it okay you're gonna save an image in this location and you're gonna use this format right now we're set to PNG um, this is where if I'm animating I would set the number of frames that I want in my scene also the resolution this is very important the resolution output resolution of my uh, object right now I'm gonna render at a resolution of 1920 pixels by 1080 pixels tall except I've also got this dialed down to a 50 percent size a scale and that's that's just a convenience tool for for speed in in iterating and um, and experimenting with different um, different renders and different looks you can render something at half resolution very easily without having to retype all of your parameters here I can scale this down to 25 percent and get a very small image but if you've got an assignment that says hey your final output is 1920 by 1080 you better scale this up to 100 percent otherwise you're going to get half of that you're gonna get 540 by um, what would that be 960 I think um, I'm probably putting bad math out there on YouTube anyway that's uh, that's kinda what these do we've also got this little square right here Let's zoom in on that this little square right here is our object data tab and it has some of that same transformation information we were seeing in our properties panel you can see location rotation scale um, and we can rename this object here as well and there there are some other uh, other settings here we can change how our object looks in the viewport for instance you don't need to remember all of this I just kind of want you to understand that over here we've got a lot of different settings for different things if I click on my light my lamp then you'll notice that I suddenly have a tab for lights for lamps and I can change the type of light that it is I can change its color, I can change its power. Um, so there's a lot of settings over here. By default, uh, Blender 2.80 starts with the render engine selected of Eevee. And that's a real-time, um, pretty good uh, rendering engine. It, it's uh, physics-based rendering. It's not perfectly accurate, so I like to keep mine on cycles if I'm actually going to render something out for a final render. Cycles is an unbiased renderer uh, which means that it's a little more accurate than Eevee. It's not as fast though um, but that's I like to keep things on cycles if I'm if I'm getting ready for final output. Otherwise Eevee is really great uh, to start working and to start iterating. Alright, um, so that's roughly the interface. There's one more thing I want to point out to you and that is that in Blender, uh, it's a very unique program in terms of its interface because any window can be any type of window. For instance, I'm just realizing I forgot to tell you what this thing down here at the bottom is. This is our timeline. We're not going to spend a lot of time on that because we're not animating today. But uh, if I want my timeline to be large and my 3D view to be small, I can just drag the divider between them now I have a very large timeline and a very small 3D view but then I might change my mind and think well that doesn't make any sense so I've got these little icons down in the corners of my viewports of my windows and if I click on this one you can see that I can select a different editor type for this window I can say you know what I want this one to be my timeline and I want this bottom one to be my 3D viewport. And now 
they're essentially reversed. And I can do that with any window in Blender. I can turn my outliner into a 3D viewport. I can really mess things up very quickly here. Um, but that can be really, really handy because you don't always need the same kinds of tools and the same kinds of windows available. So if I reset this now, I'm going to put this uh, back to being an outliner. And just because I'm so used to it the other way, I'm going to change my timeline back to a timeline, my 3D view back to a 3D view. So that's important. And you can also split a window very easily and quickly. Um, the approved official way to do this is to mouse over the division between two windows, right click and click split area. And then it gives you this, uh, this little cursor here. And uh, it's, uh, it's giving me a line that is perpendicular to the area that I split. So I can click this and now I've got two windows here. And one of them uh, can be a graph editor, for instance, you know, um, it can be anything, obviously, just like any other Blender viewport. So I right click again and I can join these areas and it gives me a little arrow saying, okay, which window do you want to survive? And so I'm going to have my 3D view eat that graph editor. And we're back. So that's an important concept in Blender because you can arrange your workspace very, very specifically and precisely. Um, and it's a little bit easy to get kind of overwhelmed by that. But uh, once you get the hang of it, it starts to give you some real power, some real speed. Also, um, up here in these tabs, we have different types of editing areas already pre-configured. So if I'm ready to animate, I can click on the Animation tab. You can see that it's a different window arrangement, and I'm in a mode where uh, I can animate. So if I go back to default, then I'm back. You hit this little plus button, you can create your own uh, window setups. You can name them whatever you want and, and edit them to your heart's content. It's very, very customizable. All right, let's talk a little bit about uh, spatial navigation. So you might have noticed this little kind of life preserver here. Um, that's We'll talk about what that is in a minute, but that is sitting right in the intersection of this green line and this red line. And this red line is our x-axis. This green line is our y-axis. You might f recognize those terms from your uh, high school geometry classes. Or, if, and if, if you're wondering uh, which is which, you can always look up here at the gizmo. You can see that the red is x, the green is y, and there's a third one up and down, z. So we have three axes here, um, x, y, and z. If we only had two axes, obviously that would be a two-dimensional um, workspace. We'd have uh, the dimension that's measured in the x-axis, the dimension that's measured in the y-axis. 3D, obviously we need a third axis. Um, so where all these axes meet is the world origin. That's where this little life preserver, which is called the 3D cursor, that's where it's sitting right now. And the world origin is basically, uh, if you were to describe its position in X, Y, and Z, it would be 0, 0, 0. 0, X, 0, Y, 0, Z. And so anything that goes, if you're looking at the uh, Y axis here, anything that goes to the left of that world origin has a negative value. Anything that goes to the right has a positive value. And same with the x-axis here. Anything that goes to the left has a negative value. Anything to the right has a positive value. And with the z-axis, anything that goes above the world origin has a positive value. And anything that goes below has a negative value. So let's, let's demonstrate that with this cube here. If I select the cube and I open my properties panel back up, you can see I've got my location in x, y, and z. My location right now is 0, 0, 0. It's right smack in the center there. If I give this a, an x location value of negative 5, 
it's going to move away from me along this red line by five blender units, which are what these cubes are, these little squares on the grid. So let's try that. Negative five, enter. And sure enough, one, two, three, four grid lines are visible. Well, you might be thinking, well, why aren't there five? And that's because the center of this is one is uh, one blender unit inside of the cube. So we've got this fifth uh, fifth grid cube, grid square uh, vanishing into the cube there. And I can move this back, of course, by changing that negative five to a zero, resetting it essentially. I can do the same thing with Y. I can give that a positive eight, and it moves to the right on the Y axis. And in Z, I can give it a positive 10, and it moves up 10 blender units, 10 of those uh, grid squares. And I can, of course, reset that whole thing by just typing zeros again. So that's an important concept in 3D. Um, the world origin, measuring, you got to know what your units are, and Blender can change units. You can tell it to use inches. Uh, you can tell it to use the metric system. You should know in terms of uh, Blender's physical simulations and, and uh, in terms of how it operates internally, one blender unit, one of these grid squares, is equal to one meter. So you're essentially already operating in metric. Uh, one thing I also want to stress is that we're going to start loading up commands with the keyboard here. And when you are trying to manipulate your object, for instance, uh, Blender is paying attention to which of your windows your mouse cursor is in. So if I want to um, rotate this cube and I type a rotate command on the keyboard uh, and my mouse cursor is over here, it's going to assume I'm trying to do something with whatever my cursor is hovering over, even if I haven't clicked on anything. So that's a very important concept and it's, it's a way to avoid early confusion with Blender. Okay, um, in terms of just kind of navigating here, you can use the mouse wheel to zoom. And one thing I always like to change in terms of Blender's default behavior, if you go up here to the Edit menu and then click on Preferences, I'm going to click on Navigation here. Uh, you see this little checkbox here? Zoom to mouse position. I always check that, and part of the reason is that I came from an engineering firm way back in the day where I was using AutoCAD, and AutoCAD behaved that way. Uh, I also check orbit around selection because I find that really handy. So if I tumble my view, which I'll show you how to do in a minute, it keeps my selection visible. So those two things I always check in the uh, Blender user preferences. So scrolling up and down zooms in and out. And um, if you want to pan your view, as in just kind of move your, move your visuals along an axis, you can hold down Shift and then middle click and drag. And then I can pan my view in any direction I can drag. And that's, that's a two-dimensional, there are only two dimensions of options there because I can't, I can't move it in and out really so you can see the cube is not getting farther away from me it just lets me pan it up and down and finally um, if I want to tumble my view so that I'm looking at a different part of the cube I can just middle click and drag no keyboard modifier there and that's a really handy way to be able to look around your object it's also if you lose track of your axes, a good way to forget which side is which um, of a symmetrical object. So, you know, which part of the cube is the front now? Well, I happen to know that I'm looking at the front, and the way I can tell that is by looking back up here at my gizmo. Uh, the x positive values are going to the right, y positive values are going to the back, and that is um, basically means that this face here is my front view. Speaking of front views, um, if I want to look specifically at a side of this, I can do so in two ways. So if I want to look right at the front, 
I can click on my gizmo on this little front axis and you can see up here that this is a named viewport it's called front perspective now that perspective means that blender is trying to kind of fool my eye into by giving me vanishing points on this grid here and you can see that you can you can kind of tell what's supposed to be farther away and what's supposed to be closer so those perspective lines they can be really handy for sort of looking at things and saying okay I I think I get what's happening here but they can also fool you because we're representing 3D space on a two-dimensional screen so if I want to turn that off perspective that means I'm trying to shift to what's called an orthographic viewport orthographic basically doesn't have those vanishing lines it doesn't it doesn't establish a vanishing point things don't get smaller as they get farther away and I can do that in two ways I can tap 5 on the number pad that's my preferred way because it's so quick and you can see now that the back of the cube is the same size visually as the front of the cube or I can just click on this little guy right here that's actually the mouse click button for changing from an orthographic to a perspective viewport now in orthographic mode these named viewports front right left back top bottom they make a lot more sense so if I click now on my front uh, on the on the gizmo to give myself a front view then you can see that this just looks like a two-dimensional square instead of a three-dimensional cube and that's because I'm looking straight down the y-axis at it and that can be really handy because I know um, exactly if I move this thing to the right or the left I'm not moving it at all along the y-axis because I'm looking down the y-axis if that makes sense and um, you can click on this gizmo to get these views there's top, there's bottom there's right, there's left back, front um, or my preferred method is to use the number pad on the keyboard uh, not the numbers across the top but the number pad to the right, the 10 key so if you tap 1 you get a front orthographic viewport if you tap 3 you get a right orthographic viewport if you tap 7 you go to the top and with any of those if you tap 9 it gives you the opposite view so we're currently looking at a top orthographic viewport we tap 9 and we're looking at the bottom so that can be a really quick and easy way to kind of navigate around your views or you can use the gizmo if you're more comfortable uh, clicking with a mouse alright uh, moving on so we've got three objects in this scene only one of which is really an object that has any geometry to it that shows up if we were to render uh, and that's the cube of course so currently um, we have we have a few different transformations uh, that we can apply to this thing we have for instance I just showed you a move transformation the way to do that you can see we've got our tool palette over here we've got a move uh, tool a rotate tool and a scale tool and those are your three primary transformations move rotate and scale so if I click on move you can see that I've got this little gizmo here and it's got three axes and it's also got these three squares that kind of inhabit the space between axes so if I want to just move this in the y-axis I can click on this green arrow and you can see that it is totally constrained if I decide oh I'm making a mistake and I don't want to move it after all and I really want it to just snap back exactly where it was I can just hit escape before I um, let go of the mouse before I ever commit to that now if I want to move this in the Y and the Z axis but not the X axis I can click on this little square that's between those two axes and you can see that it's also constrained in kind of a funny way it's moving along the Y axis and it lets me move it along Z but it doesn't let me move it along X 
and I know that kind of looks like it is uh, because we're in two dimensions, but if I drop it here and then tumble my view, you can see it did not move along this axis at all. So let's undo that and snap that back. Now that's, that's the move command. Um, if I want to move it in any axis freely, then I can just click kind of outside of that trident. And now I actually am moving it in the x-axis somewhat as well. The problem is it's a little bit unpredictable. It looked like I was moving it a lot farther than that. Um, but I wasn't because, I, again, we're representing a 3D space with a, on a two-dimensional flat monitor space. And that doesn't work very well for that kind of arbitrary movement. So let's undo that again. My preferred method of movement, again, uses the keyboard. And I'll show you the keyboard for that. Uh, the keyboard shortcut for the move command is G. And I always think of it as grab. So if I hit G then it loads my cursor. Wherever my cursor was, it loads my cursor with the selected object in a move command. And uh, I can constrain this with the keyboard. If I only want to move along the x-axis, I can hit G, X. And you can see it's now constrained. No matter where I move my mouse, it's only moving along that x-axis. So if I tap G, G and Shift X, it's essentially the same as if I were clicking on this little box right here. So the Shift X essentially means not X. I don't want to move in that axis. So G to load your cursor, then tap X, Y, or Z, or Shift X, Y, or Z to either include or exclude an axis from your movement, and then um, if you want a precise movement, you don't have to type things up here. I can, for instance, move this cube five blender units to the right in the x-axis by typing a five on the keyboard. So if I type G, X, five, and then press enter, uh, I have moved this cube exactly five blender units to the right on the x-axis. So it's really easy to be precise if you use the keyboard instead of the mouse. And this, uh, this stays the same in all of your transformations. So I can rotate, if I click a rotate tool, I get similar, um, similar functions here. I've got a green um, circle to rotate in around the y-axis. This essentially treats the y-axis as if it's an axle on this object. I hit escape to dismiss the command before committing to its changes. Same with x, and of course z. Um, but I can load my cursor with a rotate command. Oops, I, looks like I missed on the x. Uh, I can load my cursor with a rotate command by just typing R on the keyboard. And right now, what kind of axis is that? Well, it's rotating uh, down the axis of my view. So it's not a named axis, it's not X, Y, or Z, but it's pretending there's an axle coming straight out of my eyes to rotate this thing out of. So from here I can constrain my axis again. Tap Y, and I'll rotate around Y. Or tap Shift Y, and it allows me to rotate in the other axes, which are Z and uh, X, of course. And if I want to rotate precisely, so R, X, 45, you can see that this has been rotated exactly 45 degrees. And that's a really, really handy uh, thing there also to be able to, to rotate precisely, to manipulate these objects very precisely. Scale works the same way. You can scale in one axis, in two axes, or in all axes. You can scale arbitrarily, or you can scale precisely with the keyboard. So if I just want one axis, I can scale in Y by dragging this little box that's uh, got the green indicator. Uh, the box in between Y and Z will give me just scaling in Y and Z. So you can see it doesn't maintain its perfect square sides on all sides that way. If I just click and drag anywhere, it, uh, it's scaling all axes the same. 
Or I can do that with the keyboard. The keyboard shortcut to load your cursor with a scale command is S. And of course, constraint and axis, there's X. And uh, scaling is always a multiplicative operation. So if I want this twice as long in the X axis as it currently is, SX2 will give me that. If I double it again, uh, it's going to scale twice as much as it did last time, SX2. So I can undo both of those. That's a multiplicative operation. That's really handy to know, really important to know, because uh, sometimes you can multiply to get a lesser result. For instance, if I have um, a need, and I don't know why I would need this, but if I need this box to be perfectly absolutely mathematically flat and have no width in the X dimension I can do that S X zero uh, because anything multiplied by zero is of course zero and this has no X dimension now and you can see that over here dimensions in X are zero um, so that's how scaling works uh, and these all these operations were all applied to the object as a whole, as you can see. Now, what if I want to make this cube into more than just a cube? Well, there's a mode for that. It's called edit mode. And currently, you can see down here, we've got an indicator saying, hey, you're in object mode. And if I click here and go into edit mode, things don't look much different but I've got these little dots on the corners of my cube now those are called vertices um, and a vertex is basically an intersection of an edge there are three components essentially that make up a 3d object there are vertices there are edges and there are faces so these little dots those are vertices it's uh, singular uh, you would call it a vertex the line in between two vertices is called an edge. And the flat space made up by joining these edges together, you've got to have three or more. Uh, in this case, we all have quads. We've got four on each side. is called a face. And I can manipulate any one of these objects by themselves. Down here, I've got a vertex selection mode, edge selection mode, or face selection mode. So let's kind of look at what each of those look like. This is vertex selection mode. This is edge selection mode. You can see my vertices are now invisible. And this is face selection mode. So if I click on a face in face selection mode, I'm selecting the whole thing. Edge selection mode acts a little different. I'm just selecting edges. Vertex selection mode, I'm just selecting those little corner dots. Um, and I can apply any of my transforms to those too. So I can tap G to load my cursor and I can start moving these vertices around. Or I can do that with a whole face. And you can see that this thing doesn't have to be a cube anymore. Um, what if I want to rotate? Well, I can do that. I can start twisting things and I can get really weird um, really fast. That's That's where the real power of modeling starts to come in is when you start to edit these initial objects. So let's talk a little bit about selection since we've been doing it right in front of you now. Um, there are a couple of different ways to select and these pertain to object mode and to edit mode. Um, so if you want to select multiples of something you hold down shift. If you want to just select a single object you just click on it. If you want to deselect you click away or you can hit alt A to deselect all or you can just double tap A really fast to deselect all. Select all, by the way, is just A. A for all. So that's how you select everything. And if you double tap A rapidly, it will deselect everything. Or, again, Alt A or click away. Um, so that's kind of basic selection. If you want to select multiples, you hold down Shift while selecting. Um, there are a few different types of selections. Uh, you can see up here that we've got a selection tool loaded. 
select box and if I tap the W key on the keyboard it gives me different selection types there's just normal select which is just to click select box is the default uh, that allows you to click and drag a box around things select circle what's that that is essentially treating your cursor like a paintbrush for selection or select lasso that one's pretty self-explanatory and also really handy kind of fun and again with all of these if you hold down shift you'll select multiples uh, but select box is the default behavior uh, if you want to select the opposite of something let's say I'm initially going to uh, just manipulate the top of this box I'm gonna scale that down then I think well now I want to scale everything else up uh, control I will select the inverse of your selection so that allows me to really quickly kind of swap my selection around um, now it can be really handy to be able to see both sides of an object because right now even if I grab my paintbrush selection I can't select anything on the other side of this uh, pyramid kind of thing that I'm building here so if I want to see the other side of it, I've got to I've got to go into wireframe mode, and a wireframe just shows kind of the framework. It's it's like looking at a building without any sheetrock on the walls. So if you click this little wire sphere right here, that'll show you a wireframe view. And in a wireframe view, you can actually you can select the other side of things. Oh, by the way, with the circle select, if you want to increase or decrease the size of your brush just scroll on the mouse um, and I always load up circle selection by tapping C on the keyboard because then as soon as I'm done with it as soon as I dismiss it with a right click or by hitting escape I go back to my old select box tool to me that's a little more of a handy behavior but in wireframe mode you can actually look all the way through an object it essentially gives you an x-ray view um, and that allows you to select all the way through an object now, if you want to be able to do that in a non-wireframe mode, you've got this little guy right here, uh, which is essentially just the X-ray, uh, show X-ray button. So if I click this, again, same kind of situation. I can select all the way through now, and it gives me a little bit more of that solid approximation. Um, I find it easier to just swap between wireframe really quickly. And the keyboard shortcut, you knew I was going there, the keyboard shortcut for doing this is Z. So if you tap Z, it gives you this little um, wheel of options here. Wireframe, solid, rendered, or look dev. And we're not going to talk about look dev much. We don't need to talk about that today. But wireframe and solid are really uh, kind of the two go-tos that you're going to hit while you're modeling. Um, and this might seem like, well, we're, uh, we're trading one button click for another. You know, tap Z, you get the wheel, and then you have to choose something. Is it really faster than just clicking down here? Well, yes, it is, because you can actually do it with kind of a gesture. So you tap Z and swipe left, and you don't have to click. Z and swipe right, you don't have to click. It goes back to solid. So that can be a really quick way to kind of handle things. And if you type Z and swipe up, then you get a rendered view. Um, so that's that's how you look through an object and that's how you can deal with both sides of it um, which is pretty handy and in wireframe you can actually turn off the uh, the x-ray view now that's kind of a new thing so uh, that's handy um, so we talked about how to dismiss a command how to lock an axis how to precisely transform with a keyboard uh, something I haven't shown you is how to duplicate an object so if I have an object here and I'm like yeah this pyramid is it man this I have arrived if I hit shift D I've got two of them and it loads my cursor with a copy and I can click to place that wherever I want or 
I can constrain my axis again. I want these things exactly on the same ground plane. I don't want to eyeball that because I'll be a little bit wrong. If I hit X, then I can constrain my axis and then click and look at that. They're exactly equal uh, in terms of height and placement with relation to the ground. I could also type a quantity for that motion. So Shift D duplicates. I can say let's constrain to X and let's go three blender units. And that's exactly what that is. There's a little bit of an overlap there so I should have picked it a little more. But I can always move it again. Let's move it with the G key, X axis, and let's go one more blender unit. So G, X, one, enter. And now I have two of the world's greatest flat topped pyramids. Uh, so this is obviously turning out to be a really good day. You can see that. Um, if I want to delete one, I think to myself, you know what? turns out I was just really tired and these pyramids aren't great enough for there to be two of them in the world. We're going to limit it to one. I can just hit the delete key. Um, if I hit the backspace key, the one that's kind of over in the main typing area, it doesn't actually delete the object. But another option for deletion, if you don't have that second right delete key or maybe you've got an old uh, keyboard from the 80s and it's broken or something but you hold on to it for nostalgia then you hit X on the keyboard and it gives you an option that can be a safer way to delete things because uh, it doesn't just go off and throw it in the bin it says kind of are you sure so if you're the type of person that likes confirmation use the X key on the keyboard alright I promised you we'd talk about this life preserver and we are going to talk about it I mentioned it's called the 3D cursor so other uh, software packages that use uh, cursors include word processors, for instance. Anything where you're going to be typing uh, text into, you know, your, into your program. And the way a cursor works there is you place your cursor and start typing, and the text starts to originate from the cursor from that point. Uh, the 3D cursor can be thought of in a similar way. So I can actually move this. Right now it's set at the world origin. And you may have noticed that kind of everything's been happening from that point. But if I hit shift and right click, then that 3D cursor moves. And that's a little bit of an arbitrary way to move it. I'm sure you can probably guess that we're going to find more precise ways. Um, but if I move that there, uh, then if I were to add a new object, it would originate from that point. If I hit Shift S, I get all kinds of uh, options for placing that cursor. And I'm going to place the cursor back on the world origin and kind of demonstrate how this works. Goodbye, beautiful pyramid. We've deleted that and boy, I don't know what kind of errors I'm getting down there. But we'll ignore it for now and hope that Blender keeps working. I've got a new add-on I'm testing to show my... Oh, great. To show my uh, keystrokes and my uh, mouse clicks and everything. And I'm afraid that might be a little bit experimental. It might be interfering with some things here. Anyway, if I want a new object here... I can click on the add menu and I can say you know what I really want where's my mesh there we are I really want is instead of a cube let's start playing with a sphere and that puts a sphere in and you can see it's right at the world origin and that's because the 3D cursor is there so if I move the 3D cursor now and I add another object uh, let's say a torus it's centered around wherever that 3D cursor is. Um, so that's kind of a good way to, to think of that 3D cursor is if you were typing these objects out, they would originate at the cursor, just like in a word processor. Um, I can use this cursor in a lot of different ways. For instance, if I move my cursor over here, if I decide to rotate this torus, it just rotates around its central point. But... I can now come down here Oop. 
let's see, I messed up a little bit, sorry, right here. I'm still used to 2.79, so I'm still trying to remember what the new icons all look like. Uh, if I come down here, this gives me a pivot point. And I can say, you know what, I want you to rotate around the 3D cursor, wherever that is. And now if I tap R, it changes its behavior. It's rotating around a 3D cursor. And if I want that behavior to be its default, I can click on this object here and I can go to the object menu and I have this little set origin menu and I can you know, say you know what let's move the origin to the center of the geometry that's actually where it is right now I can move the um, geometry to wherever the origin point is or I can say you know what let's set the origin outside of it let's put it at the 3D cursor and that moves this little orange dot to where the 3D cursor is so now if I take my pivot point back to I can use the median point, for instance, of, of the mesh, and that's not going to change how it behaves. Oh, yes, it is. Sorry. Uh, because this is now considered the median point, I guess, so I miscalculated that a little bit. But you can also look at its individual origins and rotate it around, and basically it's going to behave that way for all of these uh, calculations now. That can get a little bit weird because later on, if I were to decide to do a physical simulation with this uh, torus, it would think its center of gravity is at its origin. And that's always a really funny thing. If its center of gravity is actually outside of the object, it's going to behave really strangely and it's going to look really odd. So you have to kind of be cognizant of where the origin of an object is. Um, so these are called primitives. This is a sphere. This is a torus. We have uh, others that we can add through the Add menu. There is, of course, a sh keyboard shortcut for adding a primitive. Shift-A gets you this menu, and we have all kinds of different types. We can add lights. We can add an empty. Uh, but most of the time, we're going to be adding a mesh. And we have all these different primitives, one of which is a monkey head. That's Suzanne and uh, Suzanne's a primitive because something more complex like this, a lot of 3D packages use a teapot, but something more complex like this uh, makes it easy to test lighting and reflections and shadows in a, in a bit more of an... you see how they're going to behave with a less predictable object than a sphere or a cube. Uh, so that's why that's in there. Um, so let's talk a little bit, let's delete these objects, simplify our scene again, and I'm going to shift S, move that 3D cursor back to the world origin, shift A, I'm going to uh, get a simple cube back, I'm going to show you a couple of other edits that we can do with this. So if I uh, want to go into edit mode, I don't have to click here, I can just hit tab, tab into edit mode, takes me in and out. And there are three kind of operations that I want to show um, with regard to this cube. So if we're in face select mode, I mentioned that we can like move these faces around, but what if I want to get more precise than that? What if I need to make something more complicated than just a pyramid or a twisty box? I need more geometry to be able to describe my shape. So I need to subdivide this cube. And if I select all, I can right click on it, and that's the first option in my context menu here. I can subdivide that. And one subdivision level just cuts every face in half. You can see that's the number of cuts is set to one. Here's my little tool options down here. They popped up when I hit subdivide. But I can cut more times than that. I can cut twice or three times on each uh, face in each axis and that gives me a lot more detail to work with. Let's go back to just one cut for now. We'll commit to that by clicking away and now I've got different faces that I can use and I can describe a more complicated object by manipulating these. Um, I also want to talk about a different way to uh, subdivide maybe a little more precise, so I'll undo that and we'll just get back to our original uh, cube here. Over here I've got this option called a loop cut. That allows me to just kind of cut in one axis. 
and uh, there's of course a keyboard shortcut for it so I can either click on the button here or I can just click uh, hit control R on the keyboard and that loads my cursor with the ability to start mousing over an axis and seeing which axis my cut would be along. Now, this might seem a little arbitrary but what it's doing is it's offering me a cut perpendicular to whatever edge I am moused over. So I mouse over this edge right here and the cut is showing up that it would be perpendicular to that edge. So if I want to subdivide that way then I click to say essentially yes that's the cut axis that I want. And this is now in slide mode. So I slide this edge around to figure out where that cut's going to be. And if I want it in the exact center, I can just hit escape and it will opt out of this portion of the command. Otherwise, I just click where I want the slide to be. And I can also change the number of cuts. Or in the middle or before I select an axis, I can actually scroll to change the number of cuts or I can type the number that I want on the keyboard. If I want three cuts, I can tap three and then I get this sort of operation. So that's a really handy way to look at things. That's a really handy way to subdivide your cube because you don't always want an equal number of faces in every direction. You know, maybe we don't want this thing to be a cube anymore. Um, the last little operator I want to show you here is an extrude operation. So let's go into face select mode and let's say I want this sort of face to rise up all on its own with straight edges. If I just move this G, Z, you can see that it's sloping the edges around it, right? They're attached. That's how they need to behave. So let's hit escape to opt out of that command. I'm going to extrude it. And to extrude it is going to give me a straight kind of uh, tower coming out of this uh, face here. And what an extrude operation does is it essentially takes one face and it makes five. So extrude, you can see now that I have my original top face and I have four new faces around the edges, that the edge of what I'm dragging up there. So one, two, three, four, and five. So there are my five faces. And uh, just like any other operation, I can constrain this with the, uh, with the keyboard. So if I, oh, sorry, I should have told you, extrude is E. Hopefully you're watching down here. I'm getting a little ahead of myself. So tap E on the keyboard. And by default, I'm extruding, uh, I'm extruding in the direction that my face is facing, which right now is perfectly in the Z axis. But if I want to let go of that axis and extrude in X, then I can just tap X on the keyboard. Now that doesn't make any sense, right? It's going to be penetrating other faces and that's going to get messy. So let's change our mind and tap Y. And again, that doesn't make any sense either, but you can see what's possible. So let's go back to Z. And if I want to extrude by a precise amount, I know this cube, for instance, was originally two blender units tall. Uh, so if I want this tower to rise up the same height as the original cube above it, I can just tap 2 and hit enter. And there is my extrusion. And I can do that with any of these faces. I can now extrude from here, for instance. I can extrude from here to make kind of a sort of, we can start getting a little bit artsy with it. Um, that's what extrude does. It takes one face and it makes five. Um, you can extrude multiple faces simultaneously. So if I select these two faces, I can extrude them up, and there will be no face in between them in here. Uh, they're joined here. Um, so that's extrusion. Uh, one last thing, I guess, with regard to edit mode. I showed you how to add uh, primitives earlier. If I add another primitive here, you'll notice this one is still called cube and it's actually outside of our original collection. We deleted our original cube. So I'm going to drag that back into our collection. We have our cube. I'm going to add another primitive. 
let's add a cone. You can see we can't really see the cone because everything here is sitting right on the world origin. The cone, we can just see the outline because it's selected here, needs to be moved in the x-axis to get outside of our original cube. So we now have these two objects in our outliner. We've got a cube, we've got a cone. Cube and a cone. Um, if I am in edit mode, let's say I tab into this cube or this cone in edit mode and I then add a cube. It looks like I've got three objects, right? I don't. I'm in edit mode on the cone. Everything that I'm everything that I do to this uh, cone in edit mode just pertains to this cone. So all I really did was I added the geometry that looks like this cube to the object that is this cone. So if I tab out of edit mode, you can see that with one selected, they're both selected and there's still only one object in my outliner called cone. So I'm going to show you a mode called sculpt mode. I'm going to delete these objects. I'm going to create a new cube here. And then I'm going to tab into edit mode. I'm going to right click and I'm going to subdivide this as many times as I can in a single operation. And that's 10. And that ought to give me enough resolution to kind of make something out of this that's a little more interesting. Let's tab back out of edit mode. And down here in my modes, where it says object mode, I'm going to go into sculpt mode. And sculpt mode gives me some new tools uh, over here on the in the toolbar on the left, tool palette. Um, and I'm also going to, on the right hand side, I'm going to open or click on the tool tab here so that I can see the modifiers for my different types of tools and I'm just going to start experimenting a little bit. Let's just kind of draw with some of these tools. And You can see right now it's giving me a symmetrical result. Kind of a Minecraft look going on here. Uh, the reason it's giving me a symmetrical result is over here under symmetry. If I twirl that down you can see that X mirror is selected. So if I want to really kind of go off uh, on my own here I can unselect that X mirror and that will allow me to create something that's not symmetrical. I can also increase or decrease the strength of my brush. Use my strength to rip my brush. <laughs> and I can just sort of sculpt here. I really like using the smooth tool, especially when I've got corners like these. It's really very quickly effective on corners. And getting rid of those corners is a really good way to make it stop looking so much like we started with a cube. We really don't want what we end up with here to look so much like a cube. And I might grab the corner of this, use the grab tool here. If I increase the radius of my brush, that allows me to kind of manipulate larger or smaller areas depending on which direction I head with that. So this is really ugly. but it ought to cast an interesting shadow anyway. So I'm going to call that about done. Let's go back into object mode. Um, now everything here looks really blocky and that's because uh, you know it's it's not made up of very much geometry. If I tab into edit mode you can see exactly where that blocky look is coming from. Uh, I can kind of get Blender to sort of smooth this out a little. If I click on my object menu, um, I have Shade Flat, which is currently the option it's displaying here, and I've also got Shade Smooth, and I can click on Shade Smooth, and that looks a little bit more organic. 
Um, so I'm going to light this and render it as the last part of our tutorial here. Now, lighting looks a lot more realistic if it can cast a shadow. We don't really have a floor here, so I'm going to create one. Shift A, and I'm gonna add a plane. And you can see that that plane is kind of stuck inside this object, so we'll grab it, G, in the Z axis. So will tap Z, and just move it roughly underneath our object here, and then we're going to tap S to scale it up, and there's a floor, okay? So I've got my camera here, and that's what's going to render is the camera's view, essentially. And I showed you how to look at this from different named viewports. One on the number pad gives us a front view. Seven gives us a top view. If I tap zero, that gives us the camera view. And from here, let's actually look at a rendered view. So if I tap Z and swipe up, that shows us what the rendered view is going to look like of this object. And this is, this is not rendered out of file, this is just a preview. It's a very low sample rate. I think my light is a little bit too dim. So let's click on the lamp here. And go to our lamp properties. And let's increase the power of this thing to maybe, I don't know, 800. There we go. Okay, and that's a little bit better. Let's double it, 1600. Okay, there's a little more power in our lamp. It's kind of casting a fun shadow. If I want to render this out now, I can check my settings here. My render samples are set to 128. Currently, we're just looking at 32. My output resolution is 100% of 1920 by 1080. You can just go up here to the render menu and click render image. The shortcut is F12. And that will give me a final rendered image here. And from here I can go to the image menu. I can save as. I can save this as a JPEG or a PNG or whatever I want. And that is the introduction to Blender 2.80.